Who doesn't love a great story? So much can be learned, felt, and expressed through storytelling. But most importantly, stories can foster better understanding across cultural and social lines. Whether it be through film, song, or even comic books and digital media, stories that are able to truly reflect the global village in which we live can only help open up new horizons and shift perceptions for the better. This week on Full Frame, conversations with cultural storytellers who are spurring change. I'm Maylee in Los Angeles. Let's take it Full Frame. When you bring up Eddie Huang's name, a few things come to mind. Chef, hip-hop fan, TV host, rebel, a storyteller. Eddie is a Taiwanese Chinese American author who wrote Fresh Off the Boat, a best-selling memoir that inspired the hit American TV sitcom of the same name, which is all about Eddie's struggles growing up as a young boy trying to fit in in suburban Florida. In the last few years, Eddie has connected even more deeply with his Chinese culture and has chronicled the journey in his latest book, Double Cup Love, On the Trail of Family, Food, and Broken Hearts in China. Eddie Huang is here with me now. Eddie, great to have you here. Thanks for having it's me. It's great to meet you. This is my favorite show to watch in oh. hotels in China. Hey, man, we like to hear that. <laughs> That's awesome. I didn't pay him to say that. No, of course. I uh, watch it at the W all the time. Do you? Okay, yeah. well, I'm glad to hear you're a fan. Hopefully I get Starwood points for saying that. <laughs> okay. All right, let's talk about you now. Um, <laughs> It's only been three years, right, since you wrote Fresh Off the Book, that memoir. Yeah. And now, all of a sudden, you're coming out with a new book. Yeah. Um, that's pretty quick to pump out a new book. What was the inspiration be behind Double Cup Love? <laughs> yeah, it is. I remember when I wrote the first one, there were people, before they read it, were like, why would you read a memoir from someone who's 29 years old? Yeah, right. like, well, read the book. It's good, you know? <laughs> and uh, it is very tough to write a memoir, but so much happened immediately after the launch of the first book. Uh. Um, my life totally changed, and yeah. I had to deal with it, and I was really in searching a good way, for myself bad way. once again. It's always, well, I don't think anything in life is either good or bad. It's, mm. It just is, Yeah. right? Okay. It is, and, you know, it's the yin and yang thing, but um, I dealt with it because I shed a new skin writing the old book. Hmm. I, I got a monkey off my back, and I said a lot of things. Okay. And I think the first book is very reactionary. It's at times angry and defiant, yep. but, like, it's to be expected of someone who's an Asian that grew up in America who a lot of people called black and was not allowed to just be himself. Yeah. And so I wrote that book as a reaction for a lot of other Asian kids like me. Yep. And um, once I got it off my chest, I was like, wow, I don't need to be a reaction anymore. Now I need to figure out how I really think if all these external factors didn't exist. And I started to wonder what would my life be like if I lived in China and I was born in China, yeah. right? So I went back to China and I chronicled kind of this reverse migration. Yep. And I had also met a really, really cool girl in Brooklyn at the time. And before I went back to China, I met her, but the trip was already planned. So it's juggling like your love life, your identity, New York, China, and family and going back to explore all these things. So what did you learn about yourself and your identity going back to China? Well, it affirmed a lot of what I already knew, which is that race is a social construct. The idea of Chinese is different in China, in Taiwan, in Singapore, yep. in New York or LA, right. right? And the only really definition of it that matters is yours. And so I think every person, whether you're Chinese or Taiwanese or Japanese or African American or Irish, you have to figure out what it means to you. Yeah. What your history, your culture, your language, and all those things that go into this social construct, which is race. Mm -hmm. And you have to take control of it. This, this book is very much about how if you actually start to dig and you start to actually do the personal work, you realize that everything that was put in your head by somebody else or society and you, you allowed it to define you is not real. Yeah. And that when you start to break it down, you can finally build yourself back up. Because for a long time, I was just a reaction mm. to the way I was treated in America and the things that people said. Yeah, and this book is about owning it, developing actually my own identity that I believe in, that I've worked for, and like talking about it. So do you, when you 
Look at yourself now. Do you see yourself as a Chinese American, Taiwanese American, just or just you? I mean, what what what, yeah, no, what are you, know, you the, now? The, the, they've all affected me, right? Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, I mean, I identify as a Taiwanese Chinese New Yorker that was, you know, touched by perverted Orlando, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So that's yeah, great. Orlando's kind of the funny uncle that touched me. So, uh, <laughs> um, you know, that's an interesting way to put it. Eddie. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You know, but I have to, I have to give Orlando credit because yeah. if I hadn't been thrown in that washing machine where like no one really understood who they were or yeah. what it was or what the hell suburbia was, right? In the '90s, like I had to figure it out for myself. It wasn't like you're born in a community with a lot of Chinese Americans or Taiwanese Americans. Yeah. And you can kind of define yourself by proxy. Right. In right. Orlando, I was the one kid. Yeah. And then I had to figure out what it was about life in America, Orlando, and everything in the world that spoke to me. Yeah. And so I, th I thank Orlando for that. Well, that's cool. Yeah. So, so fresh off the boat, obviously, you're saying it was a way that you shed some of that image and, you know, some of the stuff that you needed to get rid of, right? Yeah. Um, what I find interesting, though, you know, as we know, there's the TV sitcom that's doing really well called Fresh Off the Boat. It's inspired by your memoir. It's been 21 years since there was an Asian-American sitcom. The first one was Margaret Cho's All-American Girl. It lasted one season. It did horribly. It was totally rejected by viewers. Do you think things have changed enough that in 21 years, now people are like, oh, yeah, we can see Asians on TV. That's pretty cool. You know, I'll tell you what it is. I don't think it's the people that have changed mm. because even when I was growing up in Orlando in the 90s, yes, people made fun of me. Right. But the friends I had that came to my house and ate my mom's food, it is undeniable how good Taiwanese beef noodle soup is. <laughs> okay. Undeniable. Yeah, yeah. Every single kid, Palestinian, white, Native American, black, came to my crib. Right. They ate that and they were like, wow, this is great. Yeah. I want to know more. You know? And yeah, my friends called me Chinaman all through middle school, all through high school. It was like my nickname to call me China or China Man mm. or whatever or Kamikaze. But you know what? I definitely believe they were genuinely interested in what I was doing. They didn't know how to express it. You know, people hadn't taught them how to deal with my culture. Right. But I think that people have a genuine interest in individuals. And so the, the problem for me is that I don't think networks give these things a chance. Mm -hmm. and, and it goes into the whole Oscar so white thing. Yeah. Is that you need to give people a chance to tell you what they like. But if you keep giving them what they've proven to like, you're never going to figure out anything else. Yeah. And the thing is, is that if you work in Hollywood, you see that when you go to do a pitch, your agent, whoever is working with you says, you need to make a comparison. You have to compare it to something that's proven that they already know sells and then tell them why this is a new spin on that. Right. And right. then they'll buy it because they're risk averse. But you know what? Like true visionaries, real artists, they don't look at other people. They're not reading other people. They, they speak from the heart. It's a voice that is unstoppable. And it, it's the artistic process is the most beautiful thing because at least for me, it genuinely feels like it's the hand of God. Do you know what I mean? Like mm. something is coming out of you. I don't even think I do it on my own. Yeah. I think it's like a human or universal spirit and you can't stop it. Well, let, you know, with Oscars, I, I don't know if you saw the show, um, but I'm sure you heard about the backlash, right? There are two jokes that were made during the Oscars yes. that were um, derogatory towards Asians. Mm -hmm. And everyone's reaction in the Asian community and non-Asians too, they're like, wait a minute, why is this okay? Yeah. Here's a show. It was all about the lack of diversity in Hollywood, and but yeah. it's okay to make fun of Asians. Yeah. You know, the the race conversation in America has always been binary. It's black and it's white, and nobody else, oh. you know, gets a voice, or nobody else really matters in between. You know, that's not how I think white people feel. That's not how I think black people feel. That is the way that society has pitted us against ourselves. Mm. You know. Like, society plays the barbarians against each other. Yeah. That's what they do. It's the oldest trick in the book. But, um, you know, for me, I'm not, I think 99% of what Chris Rock did that night was phenomenal. The way that he navigated African America's relationship with media, entertainment, race, everything mm. was masterful. I thought it was incredible. That joke about Asians was terrible. The results of tonight's Academy Awards have been tabulated by the accounting firm of Price, Waterhouse, and Cooper. They sent us their most dedicated, accurate, and hard-working representatives. So I want you to please welcome Ming Zhu, Bao Ling, and David Moskowitz. 
And it just goes to show someone as brilliant as Chris Rock that can understand black and white relations from his perspective has a blind spot. Yeah. But I'm not trying to take another black man down. Like, it's hard enough. Do you know what I mean? And it's not that I'm holding him to a lower standard than I would a white person. Right. But the thing is, is that, like, I think 99 out of the maybe 100 jokes he told was fantastic. Yeah. And he told one really bad one. And I want to know who wrote it. <laughs> and, and if he wrote it, then you know what? He should apologize. Shame on him, yeah. But it doesn't undercut centuries of conditioning. Yeah. And to, like, blame him individually, I'm like, he's kind of the wrong But one. it does tell you that we still have some progress to yeah, make, be made, I mean, right, yeah. obviously, yeah. If you needed that to tell you, though, like, come well, on, what have you been yeah. watching? No, no, it's, no. Yeah, there's a lot of progress. There's definitely a lot of progress that still needs to be made. Um, yeah. you, I'm curious, though. People, when I say I'm from Taiwan, I'm, yeah. when I say I'm Taiwanese, people still think I'm from Thailand. You know what I mean? Like, there's totally. a lot of progress to be made. Well, you know, people still say, where are you from? And then I'll say, oh, I'm from Ohio originally. No, where are you really from? Yeah. Right? So there's still Yeah, that. just say, ask me what my race is. Do you know what I mean? Right. Like, I'll tell you what my race is. I'm not ashamed of it. Right, but right. But yeah, where I'm from is, this is actually where I'm from. Exactly, you exactly. Um, I'm curious, your love of hip-hop hip -hop and black culture, where, did that, where does that come from and what is it about that culture and that music that you gravitate towards. Well, it, it's just that because race is binary. When yeah. you grew up in America, you only saw white or black people on television. It was an Asian person on television. It was Long Duck Dong, Saturday afternoon, after WWF, and he was like riding a unicycle, a stationary bike next to a girl that he had the hots for. Right. You know, and I was just like, Asians are emasculated, we're basically paralyzed in the media, mm. we're not allowed to be whole individuals, and neither are black people or Latino people or gay people or women. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and so the thing is, though, I felt like black people laid a lot of the groundwork for civil rights for us to start to understand what was happening to us because it happened to them. Yeah. And I, I gravitated towards it. I mm. related to it. And even as a, like, five-year-old kid... I would just, I would watch black movies, I would listen to black music, I would watch the athletes, listen to what they said. I love Charles Barkley. I modeled so much of myself after Charles Did Barkley. Did you really? Yeah. He was literally Charles one of my Barkley, for those models. of you who don't know, NBA um, yeah. superstar. Yeah. Yeah, because he wouldn't let people define him as a fat guy, as some country dude from Alabama. Like, he spoke up for himself. And so, yeah. you know, I just saw lots of black people in America sticking up for themselves and what they believed in. And they were kind of the only people that we were allowed to see do it. Yeah. I, I hate to say this because I, maybe I, if I say it, I'm feeding into the stereotype, but I'm going to say it anyway. The stereotype of Asians is that we're, we don't speak out. We're not vocal. We're the yeah. silent majority, uh, minority, and, you know, we just kind of do our thing, right? Yeah. So it's... It's refreshing, but also I think it's sometimes shocking for people when they see someone like you yeah. who's just going to say whatever he feels like saying. Yeah, I speak at colleges a lot, and Asian kids literally ask me, what made you think you could do this? Huh. What, what gives you the confidence to do this? Why right. can you do this? And I was just like, because I knew I needed to. Like, I felt a duty to myself, my grandparents, everybody. Because mm. when people call you a chink in school or people push you down or people want to fight you, you're like, you know what? My parents didn't come to America for this. That's and right. this is not who I am. That's right. I'm not the bottom of the barrel. And I refuse to let you think that. Good and so, like, you. I stuck up for myself, my family, and everybody else that I know that gets that same treatment. That gets put down. Listen, Matt, I mean, I did too, right? But I, I really think that individuals want to do the right thing. They do. You know, I meet people from all walks of life, different races. They meet you on a personal level. They care about you. They yeah. want to do right by you. They'll start yeah. to ask you, hey, what should I call you? What should I do? And, you know, it's almost weird to say or teach them, but you have to do it, right? Yeah. And I think the thing that's really to blame is that society continues to proliferate this idea of race as like a reality. That like because of this skin, you do that. And because of that skin, you do that. But it's not true. These are characteristics that have been attached like socially and politically through hundreds of years, mm. but they're not real. Yeah. And that's everything that the second book is about. Yeah. It's like to break the chains of race as a social construct. And what do you find out? What did you find out by writing this book? Did oh, you get but, an answer? Yeah, for of course. Yourself? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, but you got to read the book. Yeah. Okay, that's a good way to put yeah. it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, otherwise, what am I selling you? Well, let, let me ask you this, then. Let me ask you this, because this, the, the book was about your journey back to your identity, you know, yeah. your roots. It's also about love. 
Yeah. Right? Yeah. And trying to figure out what that means to you. Because and that's the thing that is the most difficult to do with all of these stereotypes swirling, like love. When, when you're in an interracial relationship, yeah. everything becomes a crucible. Because now you're living with people from a different race. And, like, it may be easy to go to dinner with people that are from a different walk of life than you and enjoy them for two or three hours and go home and be like, you know, it was really nice. I learned a lot from them. I'm not going to see them for three months. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Right. You do it four times a year, and you're like, no, I really understand these people now. But when you are engaged to somebody or you're in a relationship, like their family is now your family. Mm -hmm. And when you're in that crucible and when it's that close, that's when your beliefs and values really start to get tested. Yeah. You know? For you, though, going, going back to China... I know you convinced your two brothers to come with yeah, you, right? Yeah, and you know what? My middle brother now lives in Chengdu. Oh, okay. He loved it so much. The trip did so much for him. He now lives really? in Chengdu. He owns a restaurant called Papa's Fried Chicken in Chengdu. No kidding. Yeah, he opened now, a fried chicken Is he doing well? Chengdu. Doing really well. He's great. Wow. His fried chicken's awesome. Well, okay, so food runs in your family, clearly. Yeah. I mean, you know, food is such a part of Asian culture anyway, Chinese culture for yeah. sure. For you to be a chef... Mm -hmm. I mean, was that part of the plan for you, or did you just no, sort of decide that... No, my parents that... did not want me to be a chef. Okay. They did not want because me to be a chef. Because they were restaurateurs. Yeah. Yeah, so they did not want you to go in the food business. No, he, my dad in college wanted me to run his restaurant. But once I got out of that, I went to law school. He wanted me to be a lawyer. Right. And then I wanted to open the restaurant. And did you want to go to law school? Um, I, I felt like it was a good thing for me to go to law school. It was not something I genuinely wanted to do, but okay. I had run into the trouble. I had run into trouble with the law, and I was trying to go to a lot of MFA programs. I wanted to make movies, and I wanted to write books, but um, I had to check the box because I was a felon in America. Not a felon. I was very complicated. Okay. I, pled, I pled no low contendo. So it's a withhold of adjudication. It's a very, like, purgatory in the legal field. Oh, wow. But okay. There was a case... It was like self-defense, but then we didn't want to go to court. We pled out, right? Okay. So when I was applying to schools, I had to check the box like, yes, I have a criminal record, okay. right? And then I said, you know, I think if I go to law school and I behave myself for three years, prove myself, do well in law school, then maybe people will look at me like a, you know, a good person. Mm -hmm. Right? They'll give me another chance. I needed a second chance. And I okay. felt like going to law school, getting that piece of paper, and saying, hey, I can accomplish these things intellectually, and I behave myself, like, I need a second chance. So that's why I went to law school. Oh, wow. So it's not really that you wanted to maybe practice law, per se. I never was... wanted to practice law. Okay. I was interested in social justice, though. Right. Very interested in social justice. And once I got there, I was like, you know what? If I got to work in constitutional law or intellectual property law, I would do this. Because I think those are the two most interesting fields. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I won this fellowship. I got placed at a big firm. And then they had me doing, you know, corporate law. And I, I was... cannot see you doing that, Eddie. <clears throat> no, nobody can. I, I got out in six months. You, know? you did? Okay. I was, like, giving myself haircuts at the law firm and <laughs> goofing around. Okay, so, okay. Yeah. But, hey, you gave it a go at least. But yeah, then you found your passion for food and cooking. And obviously that's done yeah. well for you. I always love food. And, yeah. and the thing was, I would cook Chinese New Year at my crib, and people would come over, people would eat the food, and then I did this Food Network show, and then, you know, people at the network and my friends were like, dude, you really should sell this. This is a travesty if you don't sell this food. People should be able to experience this. And wow. That's why I opened Bauhaus. No kidding. What's your favorite dish to make? Uh, red cooked pork. Yeah? yeah? Red cooked pork is my favorite. Hong Song really? Is yeah. it, does it just make people swoon? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. It's good. I think... Uh, I think I make the best red cooked pork. Right on. Yeah. Well, Eddie, it was such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you so yeah, much for coming it. on the show. Yeah. Hey, good luck with the book. Yeah. And all of your other projects that you're working on. Yeah, I so, hope you read it. Yeah. I'll, <laughs> I'll see you soon, and I'll Definitely. let you know. Thank right. you. Okay. Well, coming up next, Comic Heroes with the Cultural Impact. We'll be right back. Young kids often have an incredible imagination that helps them create incredible characters and stories inside their heads. But then they grow up and that free spirit fades. But not Gene Yang. He never let his love of superheroes, animation, and storytelling dissipate. In fact, he made it into a stellar career. 
Jean is a renowned comic and graphic novel author who has written for iconic series such as Avatar, The Last Airbender, and Superman. Today, he is one of the most respected writers in the industry. His first graphic novel, American Born Chinese, was the first ever graphic novel to be named a finalist for the National Book Award and was the only graphic novel ever to win the coveted Prince Award in 2007. An advocate for using comics and graphic novels as learning tools, he's currently promoting his educational platform, Reading Without Walls, which encourages kids to read outside of their comfort zone. Gene Yang joins me now to tell us much more about his great work. Welcome to the show, Gene. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Wow. I'm excited to be here. I mean, talk about a list of achievements. Congratulations on all that. Thank you. It's, it's been kind of crazy. It's, it's kind of crazy, and, but it's great because you're doing what you absolutely love doing. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, when I started uh, making comics in fifth grade, I used to hang out with the, my best friend, Jeremy Kanyoshi. Okay. We would be at the lunch tables uh, making up stories. I'd do all the pencils, he'd do all the inks. Wow. And if you were to tell me then that <laughs> all of this uh, stuff would happen to me, I, I don't think I would have believed I know, so it was just innocent uh, kids just doodling, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, it really was. It was fun. I mean, we were very serious about it, but right. it was a lot of fun. Right, right. So I, I always have to ask, uh, you know, Asian Americans, fellow Asian Americans that go into fields that aren't the conventional fields, right? Because we have Asian American or, or Asian immigrant parents, right? Uh -huh. They all expect us to be lawyers, doctors, <laughs> engineers, yeah, that's right? The, that's the Chinese trinity, and doctor, lawyer, engineer. Koreans too, right? <laughs> so, so I wonder what your parents thought about you going into graphic novels. My, my mom uh, was a little more understanding. She's always had some interest in the arts. My dad is a pretty typical immigrant dad. Okay, so he, conservative. He was very into doctor, lawyer, engineer. In fact, <laughs> right before I, I went to college, he sat me down and we had this conversation. He said, you know, you need to major in something practical. <laughs> Medicine or law or right. engineering. Chemistry, and all as that, long yeah. as you get that degree in something practical, you can do whatever you want with your life. And I won't say a thing. Really? So I did. I, I majored in computer science. Okay. It's also because I do love I do love coding. But I majored in computer science. After that I became a software developer. I worked as a software developer for two years. During that two years he didn't say anything. Uh, and then I left my software development job to start concentrating on comics and also to start teaching high school. And he didn't say anything because he promised he would. Still wouldn't. didn't say anything. Ooh. But every few months I would get this little envelope in the mail <laughs> from him. And this envelope, it wouldn't have a letter or anything. It'd just have newspaper clippings. It'd be like, want ads from Apple Computer oh, or, or Google. Or, or it'd be like an article comparing uh, teacher salaries to programmer salaries. Oh, no. Every few months I'd get one. <laughs> so subtle. <laughs> yeah, so subtle. Yeah, okay. It's so my dad, too. But they must be so proud now, obviously. Yeah, yeah. And, and the turning point, for my dad at least, was um, right after American Born Chinese came out in 2006, yeah. uh, a Chinese-language newspaper uh, came and, and did an interview with me and featured me on, on their, like in their living section. Oh, you know? wow. And, uh, and when I went to visit him after that happened, he actually had that article clipped out and laminated. Oh, my god. And that's goodness. when those little envelopes stopped. That's amazing. That is amazing. Um, so let's talk about, uh, you know, the, the storytelling part of what you do, because that, it's not just, people sometimes think of graphic novels, oh, it's just a bunch of, you know, pictures and cartoons and things like that. But there's story, true storytelling in graphic novels, right? Yeah, I, I think in, in America, for a really long time, when people thought of comic books and graphic novels, they thought of only one genre. They thought of superheroes, right? Uh, maybe some funny animals, but it was mostly superheroes. Right. And, and I think it's only within the last 10, 20, 30 years that, that things have really shifted, uh, that people have, have started realizing that uh, graphic novels are just, they're almost a container, and they're a container that can contain any kind of story that you want to tell. Right, right. When you write your graphic novels and you come up with your stories, I would imagine that a part of you is in some of these stories, or at least somehow you can relate to these characters. I, I think that's true of every writer. I think every writer, no matter how fantastical your story, you do pull heavily from your own life. You know, that's part of the research that you do, is you just go through your memories right. and figure out what you can use. And what about American Born Chinese? Because that was such a huge hit, got such accolades, obviously. For you, what was that about for you to do that story? When I started American Born Chinese, I'd been doing comics and graphic novels for about five years. And I'd always, I'd had multiple protagonists that were Asian American but their cultural heritage never uh, played a big part in the story. Mm. So I wanted to do some kind of a story where that was the focus, where it was about 
cultural heritage. It was about the Asian American experience. And that's what American Born Chinese was. There are three different storylines. The first one is about the Monkey King, who's not my character. He's like this really famous... Chinese fable, yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, the second one, I pulled heavily from my own life. It's a fictional story about a, a young Chinese American boy growing up in a predominantly white neighborhood. Right. But that, I pulled heavily from my own junior high experiences. To right. Tell. Yeah. Junior high was a little rough, right? I think it's rough for everybody. I, listen, <laughs> Gene, you and I, I'm sure, have lots of stories about yeah. how rough it was to be an outsider. So when you were writing this and then you got the reception that you did to the book, were you surprised that... I was shocked. Yeah, you were Absolutely. shocked. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. When I started uh, in, in comics, it was the mid to late 90s. At that time, I don't know if you remember, but Marvel Comics had declared bankruptcy. Yes. And comics in general in America were just was, not doing dying. very well. Yeah. Right. I, I would go to these comic book conventions with my friends. And, and some of the days at those conventions, there would be more exhibitors oh, no. than there were <gasps> attendees, which is the exact opposite of how it is now. Now right? it's crazy. Now it's crazy. Yeah, but back then people just thought it was a dying art form. Mm. So to go from uh, a situation like that to now where, you know, there's a New York Times bestsellers list that's focused on graphic novels, comic book conventions sell out months before they're held, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. So the way I pictured my life was I thought I would just teach high school full time okay. and I would always just do comics on the side. Wow, wow, but you never thought it'd be turned into No, like this it. is... And then getting these kind of awards, yeah. all these awards, and then now you're, what is it, the National Ambassador for Young People's literature you were appointed by the library of congress yeah that was uh That's that was huge. a crazy thing it was like one of the fanciest things i've ever been <laughs> it, it happened it? this past january i flew out to the library of congress they gave me the super fancy medal it was uh <laughs> It was a lot of fun, but but I really do feel lucky to be involved in comics, you know, when when I'm involved in comics, like in this era. What is it? What is it about graphic novels that uh, makes it different from other types of illustrations and comic books? Well, I, I do think you know graphic novels are just one of many different ways that we can tell stories, and there are certain stories that just work better as graphic novels than they do in any other medium. For me, my attraction comes uh, from a pre-logical place. Like, I think I fell in love with graphic novels, and then I thought about why I fell in love, right? Yeah. But one of the things I appreciate the most is this interplay that you have between the visuals and the words. That relationship that the pictures and, and the words can have can be really, really complex. And you can, as a creator, you can really play with that complexity. As a reader, I think it gives your mind a little bit something more to, to hang on to. Mm -hmm. You were once quoted saying, living a life without art, living a life without stories, is a smaller life. Yeah, I, I think it is. I think it is. I mean, I, I just think storytelling is so fundamental to the human experience. Yeah. It's, we, we constantly tell stories about ourselves in our own heads. You know, we understand other people. Uh, through stories, That's so right. it's, I, I, I think it's I think it's actually almost impossible to live as a human being. Right, without right. it's a way to exchange culture, social issues, you know, and the environment. I mean, all sorts of yeah. ways that you can understand each other, right? Through yeah. storytelling. Yeah. But here's my question, though: in this day and age of social media, where all kids are on their smartphones or their iPads or whatever, and they're just their attention span is getting shorter and shorter. Do you worry that, you know, this new generation is not going to be reading as much and they're not going to be as interested in stories? Yeah. I mean, I'm 42 years old, so I do worry about myself. I worry that my own worries are rooted in my old manness. You know? <laughs> You're not that old, Gene. Come on. <laughs> so, um, but but I do I do think about it. You know, yeah. I do think about how uh, kids these days are growing up in a in a much noisier world, and that noise isn't necessarily bad. It's just there's there's, there's a lot, lot of more distractions. Competing. Yeah, there's a lot, lot more competing for their attention. Yeah, and I do think for books especially, you need that quiet place. Yeah, you know, and and uh, and that and, focus, and, and, and that focus, and I think it's really good for you. I mean, they've even done research about it, right? Yeah. Like like yeah. being able to sit down quietly with a book for an extended period of time is good for your brain. It's good for your spirit. Right. Uh, and, and I think um, at least with the kids that I've met, they understand that they they get like if they've sat down and they've read a book for a half an hour or an hour or whatever. They know the difference that it makes in, in themselves, in they their own interior life. They right? experience it. So I, I don't necessarily, I feel hopeful. I feel hopeful that this new generation has that same value for stories. That well, we your platform, Reading Without Walls, I mean, that's all about encouraging kids to read. But beyond that, you're trying to get them to read 
out, like I said before, outside their comfort yeah. zone. So yeah. tell me about what you're trying to accomplish there. Well, the, the national ambassadorship was established in 2008. Uh, every term runs for two years, and every ambassador is encouraged to come up with a platform, something that they want to focus on. I had a meeting with the Library of Congress and with the Children's Book Council uh, last year, at the end of last year, and we came up with this platform of Reading Without Walls. Mm -hmm. What we mean by that is essentially what you said. We want kids to read outside their, their comfort zones. Uh, essentially, we want kids to explore the world through books. Exploration is such an important part of, of growing up, and books are such a great way of exploring. You yeah. know? Specifically, we want them to do three things. Number one, we want them to pick out books uh, with people on the cover that don't necessarily look or live like them. Second, we want them to pick out books about topics that they might find intimidating. Mm. So for me, you know, I grew up as kind of a nerd. I don't know if you can tell, but I was kind of a nerd. <laughs> no. I was not into sports at all. Okay. And I was especially not into basketball. Every time I played basketball, I got You're so hurt. tall. I know. That was the thing. <laughs> that was a, like, but height doesn't come with coordination, Okay, right? that's true. <laughs> Those two things are not genetically linked. That's true. So basketball has always been an intimidating topic for me. Okay. And I ended up getting interested in basketball in part because of books, because I read these amazing books yeah. about basketball. And finally, we want kids to explore reading in different formats. So for a kid who's never tried a graphic novel, we want them to try a graphic right, novel. Right. And for a kid who only reads graphic novel, I want them to try uh, prose books or, or books in verse. Great goals, all three of them. All right, Gene, thank you so much for coming and you're doing great stuff. Thank you for having me. This was fun. Well, from graphic novels to music, innovators like Jean are making an impact. Mama Kadim is a great example. She is an Iranian-American songstress whose unique sound blends ancient Persian poetry with bold musical risk-taking. She has been called one of the wonders of world trance music. But as Full Frame contributor Sandra Hughes found out, Mama Kadim would like to be remembered as a cultural nomad who uses her art to bridge traditions and tell a new story of cultural diversity. She is a teacher and a singer, plucking at the heartstrings of her homeland's classical music. Smile, cheeks up, smile. I was born in Tehran, Iran, and my parents are both Iranians. And I grew up in Iran and came to the United States in 19, uh, end of 1976. She always thought she would go back to Iran someday, but a revolution kept Ma Makhodem in the United States. I wanted to do something that connected me to my culture, so I chose the Iranian classical music, the traditional music. But no one can say that she sticks to tradition. I started with a group called Axiom of Choice. We wanted to take our traditional music, but kind of like put our own um, understanding and impression on it. And so the, the classical, the traditional music became a basis for our work. However, you know, we went outside of, like we went beyond the tradition. She has traveled the world learning about her Persian roots and adopting sounds from other places along the way. It's a cross-cultural, uh, it's, it, it's rooted in traditional music. It is about um, uh, bringing some of the very beautiful melodies from the villages, from the different uh, regional music of Iran, putting it into some kind of a form that is more available for the non-Iranian, together with the Iranian second generation, third generation, that's accessible to them.
think it's the singing and it's what she's singing. The messages are about love, they're about integration. There's something about this music that's so incredibly soulful and gets me back in touch with my own culture. of Noruz, the Persian New Year that is celebrated on the first day of spring, Khurram dines with her Iranian friends and gets ready to share her message of cross-cultural dialogue while celebrating her Iranian heritage. Khodam is the headliner of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art's 2016 Noruz Celebration, sponsored by the Farhang Foundation. Khodam's audiences are by no means all Iranian, but her music is about much more than the lyrics derived from the poetry of legendary Persian poets like Rumi and Hafez. She considers herself a performing pioneer who is breaking barriers on stage and around the world. Do I need to know Farsi to get you when I'm watching your performance? I hope no. My intentions are uh, for anyone to uh, be able to pick up uh, the feelings and the expressions um, rather than the language. I really want to be able to, to connect to, uh, to the people outside of my own culture. A connection she hopes the next generation of Iranian-American artists will work to make even deeper. For Full Frame, this is Sandra Hughes in Los Angeles. And we'll be right back with a look at how digital media is helping to shape cultural stories. Well, the 2016 Academy Awards may go down as the most contentious and controversial ever, as calls for greater diversity in Hollywood grow louder and louder. Now, according to a new University of Southern California report on diversity in media, more than half of all film, TV, and streaming shows surveyed failed to portray one speaking or named Asian role on screen. That's enough to make you want to scream, right? Well, not for Philip Fung and Julia Lam. They are channeling any and all frustrations into making a difference through A3, their nonprofit group, which fosters and supports Asian American artists in American entertainment media. Both Julia Lam and Philip Fung join me now from San Francisco to tell us more about their mission. Hey, guys, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Hey, thanks for having us. Good morning. Well, listen, um, you just heard what I said about the Academy Awards. You know, it was all about the lack of diversity in Hollywood. But what's worse is that Asians are pretty much invisible when it comes to the numbers. Um, your thoughts on what's going on in Hollywood? Yeah, so I mean, I think it's a, overall a funnel problem, um, if that makes sense. So, I mean, in order to have authentic, uh, Asian American stories on screen, you need to have it through the entire funnel. So that means the screenwriters need to be able to authentically create, uh, write stories for Asian Americans. The casting director needs to be able to see an actor and be able to cast them um, at, in that role, uh, regardless of, of what the race they are. And the directors need to be able to um, uh, embrace that experience as well. So uh, you really need to see it in, uh, all through Hollywood and in order to see more diversity on screen. And also, it's not really a new problem. I mean, um, right. this has been going on for years. Yep. Um, only 1% of all uh, lead actor acting roles go to Asians. And, you know, they make up 5 to 10% of the population. Latinos the same way as well. 
um, you know, only one out of every 20 um, uh, lead roles out there are given to, to, to Asian Americans. So it's, it, it's a really uh, bad number to, to begin with. Well, okay, so let's talk about why you guys decided to start A3, and it's Asian American Artist Foundation, right? Yes, you, you're right. both with Facebook, so you know, you're relatively successful, whatever. Um, so, but why, so why did you decide to do this? Why did you decide to start this foundation? So I think like we were, you know, we, we both came from, uh, you know, after we came out of Facebook, we spent one, a very long time there. I was one of the first engineers. Julie was one of, one of the first partnership people at Facebook. We spent like eight, nine years there, came out, and then we're saying, hey, we've done pretty well for ourselves. What, you know, what, what are some problems that we see that we want to achieve next? And, um, you know, both of us, uh, you know, grew up in, in the U.S. and we just never saw any, you know, in, any people of color on TV. And, you know, it's, it's been like that since the 80s and 90s all, all the way up to today. And, you know, it hasn't changed at all. And we want to make sure that we can kind of make a difference in that. And, and the, you know, since we have been, been relatively successful, we want to help with that. And, after talking to a lot of, uh, you know, a, gr a big group of our network, um, we, we actually found out that a lot of people are interested in this issue. They just don't want to talk about it, I think. And you do that, have some programs, right, at A3 that uh, uh, cultivate that. I, I think you have something called the Sundance Fellowship. Tell me about what that program is about. Yeah, so the Sundance Fellowship uh, c goes back to, like, you know, two, three years ago when we started the foundation. We wanted to find a way to make an impact. We talked to a lot of CEOs, talked to a lot of people in the film industry as well, and everyone agrees that, you know, there, there's kind of two ways that Asians are, are kind of making a big impact. One is in, like, film and, uh, you know, more outwardly, like, uh, the, the bigger impact right now is really in digital and YouTube and things like that. But in the traditional film sense, there's, there's been, uh, it's been really hard for Asian Americans to do really well. And so we talked to a lot of, um, you know, entrepreneurs, a lot of filmmakers, and they all said, hey, why don't you start the cream of the crop? If you can get into, if a filmmaker can get into the Sundance Film Festival, um, they, they've, kind of, they've kind of got it made. They've kind of had a big leg up in their career. And we were like, okay, let's, let's talk to the executive director at Sundance and see what we can do to kind of foster that. And after kind of going through all that, we kind of came up with thinking about, um, you know, uh, why, why don't we come up with an Asian American fellowship at Sundance? Here's my question, though. Um, one of the biggest problems is that it's the decision makers at the top. It's the executives at the studio who are green lighting projects. They're the ones who say they're going to make something or they're going to buy something or not. And if that doesn't change, it doesn't matter how many stories are being made, right? How many films are being made. If they're not going to be distributed, they're just not going to see the light of day. So is, it's a structural problem too, isn't it, when it comes to the power of how, how Hollywood is structured? So I think the exciting thing about this is with the rise of digital media, you have this opportunity for more stories to more segments. So you're right, in Hollywood specifically, there's one decision maker and they're trying to create content that can appease a broader audience. And the guy in middle America may or may not be interested in, you know, content that is more diversely focused. Right. So, you know, they have to make hard decisions there. And, you know, I, I, I'm sure that's, that's difficult. But, you know, really there's, there's a lot of segments around that, you know, um, we're talking about Asian Americans today. Today, but you know, I mean, even the Latino segment, females, um, lots of other groups as well, where they're just not getting as much play on mainstream media. But again, I think with the rise of digital media, YouTube, Hulu, uh, Netflix, Amazon, you're seeing that there is again this this audience that really wants uh, more diverse content, more diverse storytelling, and you see like the people that look like them on camera as well. If you have an Oscars where, you know, they're, they're touting diversity and then you could still throw in a major Asian joke in there and no one really cares. I mean, it, it's, it's, right. it's, it's, it's really showing that the mainstream kind of traditional media is really lagging behind. Yeah. I mean, in the last few years, though, there has been this, this switch where, you know, I mean, Fresh Off the Boat, I mean, clearly is one of the first Asian American sitcoms in the last 20 years. Well, Julia, um, I was, gonna, I was actually going to bring up Fresh Off the Boat because at, at least that's an example. Of yes, a mainstream absolutely. show, right? Of a mainstream show that can be seen by a broader audience. And the statistics show the demographics of the audience is actually pretty widespread. So it's not only Asians watching that show, it's across the board. So that's a proven concept right there. Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, I think that in the last 20 years, you know, we've seen a lot of, 
uh, change. Um, you know, we I, we don't see as many roles as we would like in you know Asian Americans in leads. You know, again, one percent right now. But right. you are seeing Asian Americans at least on camera, at least like you know here and there as a character. Um, still not as much a screen time, but again, they're there, they're present. And so I think it finally set the scene for um, a sitcom to finally make it. And I think that they've done a great job throughout um, the entire process. You know, from again the screenwriters, you know, being a diverse set of screenwriters to casting directors to the directors to try to create something that's really authentic to the Asian culture, but that also appeals to a broader audience. And I think Fresh Off the Boat is a fantastic example of that, and I hope to see many more. Hey, Julia, Phil, I love the fact that you're doing this, and good luck to you, and we'll definitely keep in touch and see if there are improvements to come along. Hopefully there will be. So thanks so much, guys. Thank you. Thank thanks you. for having us. Thanks for having us. Well, we'll be right back with this week's full frame close-up. Stay right there. Finally this week, a multicultural story that spurs a different kind of change. The kind you find in your pocket. Washington, D.C. commuters bombarded with the noise of loud trains and the hectic pace of life in the nation's capital are now being soothed by a more pleasant sound, a mesmerizing countertenor. Hisham Breedlove often performs at the entrance of train stations where he accepts donations of appreciation. Hisham grew up in Zimbabwe where he perfected his voice at a young age. In Zimbabwe, opera music is revered. Hisham hopes to foster that same appreciation for the art in the U.S. by giving people the opportunity to experience it where they least expect it, on a busy street in the middle of rush hour. Music is not an endangered species. Classical music, opera, is no longer an endangered species. Well, when I'm singing out on the metro, I can't even describe the, the gift that you get from having someone come up to you and tell you, no, I, I, may, I don't have a dollar today, but I just want to tell you you made my day and you just, you really touched my soul and I'm so grateful for that. It made me become a far more humble person. It made me respect human beings and respect the, tr the trials and tribulations that they all experience because we all experience them. In Zimbabwe, we were colonized by the British and South Africa um, had portions of it that were colonized by the British as well. And you know, the German, Flemish, the part of the world that still today appreciate and value classical music as if it were a precious jewel. You know, it was a standard um, in the education system that you take up two hobbies. I chose piano and choir. Maybe three, four months of being in the choir, my choir director pointed me out of the choir and she insisted that I do a solo because we had competitions coming up. It's my very first certificate ever. That was the, the bud, buddings of my career as a solo singer. And my parents signed me up at the Zimbabwe College of Music to take bri private voice lessons. <laughs> This um, world-renowned boys' choir, the Drakensberg Boys' Choir School that um, was located in the mountains of 
with the Drakensberg in South Africa. After every tour, they were auditioning. And after the auditions, they um, sent all the other fa families home and pulled my mom and dad aside. And they asked if it would be possible, if they could possibly actually just leave me right now. And they would provide all my uniforms and everything. I had no idea that one day I'd be sent alone on my own at 17 years old to America with two suitcases and good luck, you know? I had a really tough, tough beginning. You know, I came from a school where I was a semi-celebrity to now being an ant in the ant in the United States of America. And it was very, a very daunting feeling, I, I will not lie. I struggled for my first two years. I had a lot of folks that took advantage of me because of my um, innocence and humbleness. I chose the Metro originally because it was a suggestion from my mom. And, um, but then I realized that, you know, not only was it a venue to help out with paying a couple of my bills, but I realized that, you know, it was a venue that I was able to practice. I was able to promote myself, touch people's lives and have them touch my life. We definitely know that our child is gifted and has a gift from God. Yeah. We definitely do know that. Yeah. I know it's for you. I know this is for you. Yeah. I know it's for you. Yeah. And we're behind you 100%. We have nothing but admiration for you. Yeah, I wonder. Thank you. I got into Washington Adventist University was because a gentleman came up to me one day and said, you have a fantastic voice and I think you'd go far at my school. And I attended the school and they offered me a full ride. I am a countertenor and countertenor is um, a male voice range that derived from the early, early centuries where they um, had what we call castrati, castrati singers. He has a very, a very unique voice and he also is, is, is made for the stage. So, among the students I've had, we, one does not get a countertenor very often. Come in! How are you, Annie? Good to see you. So, when you encounter one, it is, it's really quite a pleasure. Yes, I'm back in D.C., and as you can hear, my voice is yeah, you don't 100%. Sound good. Yeah. I've been singing 100 miles an hour. Uh, not necessarily for the money, but just primarily to promote myself. Well, I suppose that would, that's what keeps you going. Of course, you yeah. have all the regulars. They probably miss you. Yes, they after do. After being gone for a couple of years. Oh, my gosh. Yes, they do. <laughs> Coming up the metro, and I, I will probably cry every time I hear you sing, for as long as I hear you sing. Awesome, I love you. <laughs>
for all the years, all over the years, yes. from the beginning. Yes. You know, I remember. And then I didn't see you for about two years, and I was at Pentagon City, and yeah. I was in a hurry, and yeah. I was having a bad day, and I heard your voice coming out from the metro, <laughs> and I just wept. I was like, so, so amazing to see you again. Thank you. I can't believe that everybody that passes by him doesn't either stop and listen for a while or give him some money. <laughs> And anyone who's fortunate enough to hear him sing, it should change their day. I would love to see him really now take all the skills that he's worked so hard for in the last 10 years and really put them together in a nice package and go out and audition for people away from the metro but really in a professional uh, situation. The world needs to hear him. Oh man, that's awesome sound, awesome sound. Whether you're selling computers, whether you're selling eggs, whether you're singing in the, in the subway, uh -huh. As long as you do it well, what he loves, then and you do what, what you love, and you're happy in your heart. You're happy, boy. That's all I say. I didn't give up, and that's one of my main um, mantras in life. Don't give up and keep pushing forward. Once you've achieved greatness, try and double it, you know? He's so talented. Well, that's it for this week. Join the conversation with us on social media. We are CCTV America on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. And now you can watch Full Frame on our new mobile app, available worldwide on any smartphone for free. Get the latest news headlines and connect to us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Weibo. Search CCTV America on your app store to download today. And of course, all of our interviews can still be found online at cctv-america.com. And let us know what you'd like us to take Full Frame next. Simply email us at fullframe at cctv america.com. Until then, I'm Maylee in Los Angeles. We'll see you next time.